Hi, this is Dr. Graves back with essentially part three of the video series on least squares regression with crime data. And this tutorial demonstrates these processes necessary to prepare the data, both from the census and the crime side, for statistical modeling. What you see on the screen in front of you are the variables, these ones at the bottom that I have calculated, the percentage of people 15 to 25, which was demonstrated, but then off camera. I did uh, the percentage of white non-Hispanics, the percentage of people with a high school diploma, uh, the percent Hispanic and black, percent of families that are husband and wife headed, percentage of households that are occupied by renters, and then the burglary and assault rate. The burglary and assault rates were calculated using a formula where I took uh, the value of the average number of burglaries that is reflected in the map, divided that by the population, and multiplied the whole thing by 100,000. And uh, you can take a look at uh, the result of all of these in the attribute table, these two, burglary rate and assault rate, will become our dependent variables. And then a collection of these created new variables and some that already were pre-existing will become our candidate variables. So uh, I'm going to close these two attribute tables and we can get started. So the first thing that you would want to do is to click on the analysis tab and then select from the options the tools. Over in the geoprocessing window type the word regression. This brings up a variety of regression tools. The first of which we're going to use is exploratory regression tool and as it says it evaluates all possible combinations of the input candidate explanatory variables and then it will help us find ordinary least square remodel that uh, best explains what's going on. The input feature of course is the map that you see in front of you which is called AV underscore 2018 block group join 2 and let's start with the dependent variable burglary rate. The explanatory variables that we will try out population density, how about average household size for the heck of it. We're not going to use the renter stuff here and all of these have been converted into percents with the exception of the diversity index. I'll scroll down, let's try uh, median household income and maybe average uh, disposable income as well. And the, the glory of this is that one of these two would turn out to be better in the model and the software will figure that out for us. We could select, you know, median net worth as well. Let's also uh, select percentage uh, in the young category, 15 to 25, non-white, diploma, Hispanic or black. Uh, the percent non-white and Hispanic, one of the two will emerge as a better candidate percent nuclear families, percent renters, and that's it. We can uh, select a output report file if we want, and we just need to give it a name. We'll call this Exploratory LLS1. Click Save. It'll write to that. And if we look under Search Criteria, maybe we'll move that up to 7 and make the minimum number three, the minimum ex acceptable adjusted R squared. Uh, 0.5 is there, coefficient p-value 0.5, which means we want a 95% confidence interval, and uh, the rest of this is fine. Click Run and wait a moment. Here is the output, the short version of it, and if we want the text file, we can click here and it launch in another window. I'll drag it over and here's how we want to read this. We'll scroll down and we'll look for the highest of the adjusted R squares. This one is great but in terms of adjusted R square but the variance inflation factor is too high so we won't be able to use that. Uh, we may take a look at this model here 
because its VIF is low. This one has a little bit higher adjusted rate. So these are options for our end model. The variables that seem to work best are the ones with the asterisk. Uh, those we should hope that all of them have at least one which tells us that they're significant in the model and so we see in this when the diversity index isn't working. So we scroll down here it, it will begin to tell us in all of the models that the software ran which of these models actually worked pretty well uh, were significant. So it's interesting that percent high school grad worked in basically none of them, so we won't use it. Percent Hispanic and Black worked in few of them, so we probably won't use that. Percent White, uh, the inverse of it, it was mostly negative, uh, so we might be able to use that if we scroll back up here. Uh, we see it does appear in uh, this model that I liked pretty well here. And then we see some of the others that actually seem to be far more significant in all of the models topped by population density. And uh, this is CY for census year 2018. Down here, the summary of multicollinearity tells us which of the things uh, get caught up or are flagged because they are too similar to each other. So median household income and average disposable income were a hundred percent of the time too collinear, so we wouldn't, we can't keep both of them. Uh, median income has too much multi or has too much collinearity with percent white, also a uh, percent Hispanic and diversity income uh, index a little too often. Not surprisingly, here the average disposable income is reciprocally violating multicollinearity. And uh, so here's some other diagnostics about uh, residual normality. And it looks like most of these are pretty good. We'll come back to all of that uh, later. So the model that I liked best, and of course you can choose others if you like, was this one here that's highlighted. And so what I need to do is to move this over where I can see it, click on this and uh, to get rid of it and go back one. Now I'm going to select from the list of possible regression tools, ordinary least squares. This is uh, the most standard of all. And the input feature class, once again, is the block groups join two. The unique ID field would be There should be a, a column called ID. For some reason, it's not appearing in this. I'm going to try total population and just hope that no two of the census tracts has the exact same population. If they do, it's going to cause it to crash. OK, starting over, I created a new ID field called ID2. And all I did was, let's show you how that worked. I created a new column of data. It was an integer column. The type was long. In order to calculate the field, all I did was take this ID field and tell it to give me the uh, equivalent, a numeric equivalent of object ID. So I just did that, clicked apply, and it calculated the, this field. I can now use it as a unique ID field. Why it doesn't allow us to use a text column or a, and we're going to call this, this new one, uh, OLS1 is going to be our first model, except I've already done this, so we're going to have to call it two. The dependent variable was the burglary rate. And once again, we're using the variables that the exploratory regression suggested. And those were population density, average household size, percent aged 15 to 25, percent white non-Hispanics, percent nuclear families, and percent renter. The output file, we were going to call that 
OLS2, click Run. It takes a moment, it produces a map. We can view the output report as a PDF. Here it is, and here are the model variable diagnostics. Each of these has an asterisk to the right of the robust probability, which means that each of these variables is actually working, sort of pulling its own weight. Uh, the robust T uh, from this column here uh, should be at least 1.96, and none of the V the values in the VIF column should 7.5. We see that percent white and percent uh, nuclear family are approaching that, but still far enough away that we're comfortable with it. We see the multiple R squared is 47.6. So in essence, we're explaining about 50% of the variance and 50% of the variance in the burglary rate is unexplained. And this isn't bad for burglary because uh, burglary rates tend to be harder to explain as are most property crimes areas. Violent crime is usually easier to predict. And here's some more of the distributions of how uh, as the burglary rate goes up, um, what are the other variables. And each of these uh, histograms here all look, except for the burglary rate, somewhat normal. It's going to move this out of the way. That's all looks reasonably good. The map is a map of the residuals in the model. That means the, the difference between the predicted variable, the estimated burglary rate, and the actual burglary rate, this column. And the difference is the residual. And what the software does is take the residual and standardize it so they put it on a bell curve and we can ask for the statistics of that and we show how uh, very normal this distribution of residuals are. Those um, places that are above kind of two standard deviations above have burglary rates far above what their, the neighborhood conditions would suggest, and they account, the ones in dark red and the ones in dark blue, all account for the 50% that we are not explaining in the model. The areas in yellow on the map are the areas that we are explaining well. The last step would be to run a test called Moran's Eye to see if this clustering of the residuals is excessive. So Moran's Eye, and it looks like we'll have a violation of that. So we put in our newest map, which is this uh, OLS2 map that we just created and the input field is going to be either the residuals or the standardized residuals, either one of those. And this is a complicated sort of mess, but what we're going to say is that any of these census block groups that touch either each other, that they are contiguous, that they are considered neighbors. I'm going to generate a report and click Run. Click on View Details, and this appears. And the report file is an HTML, shows up, and unfortunately for this test, uh, our clustering is too much, which violates a basic assumption that each of the census block groups are not overly affecting each other. And it's um, well above, almost double, the threshold that we would want to uh, consider minimum, which would be 1.96 or 2.0. So I'm going to stop at this point.